Hello, Nid. Uh, thanks very much for the uh, invitation to speak in this very, very nice uh, conference. Um, uh, right, so I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about uh, a, a work regarding uh, a how to detect uh, quantum spin liquids. Uh, I'll uh, discuss some older work with uh, Mesa and Steve, um, uh, some and some more recent uh, work with uh, a, a Tomacek, who used to be a student at Weizmann and now he's a postdoc at uh, a ETH, and uh, a Kusum, former uh, postdoc at Weizmann. Yochai, uh, who's my uh, student, uh, still still at uh, Weizmann. Sid at uh, a, a the Max Planck Institute in Dresden and uh, Shubhai from, from Harvard. Uh, so uh, uh, let me briefly uh, uh, introduce quantum spin liquids. So what, what are these? These are um, electro uh, electrically uh, 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 insulating uh, materials that are quantum disordered and uh, um, uh, basically uh, uh, yet not, uh, not band insulators, so they're, they're not adiabatically connected to any band insulators. Uh, uh, now, uh, these are actually quite interesting uh, states of matter, uh, but uh, mostly uh, uh, in experiments, they're actually defined by what they're not. So what people uh, uh, typically do is take some, uh, uh, some uh, magnetic material, cool it down uh, for to, the to the lowest possible temperatures, and um, um, basically uh, uh, see if there's no if there's no uh, a, a detectable spin order. So uh, the a, a popular physical picture for such a state is the uh, uh, the RVB or f a f a resonating a valence bond state, which was uh, discussed by uh, Bela yesterday. So uh, think about some sort of frustrated magnet, uh, geometrically frustrated. So you can't satisfy all the bonds. The best you can do is basically form these. Uh, uh short-range singlet bonds, uh, and the wave function, uh, the ground state wave function would be a superposition of all the possible uh, short-range uh, uh, singlet coverings of the, of the lattice. Uh, so uh, uh, how, how do you look for a spin liquid? So you take your material, cool it down, and look for signatures, um, uh, basically nothing. Okay, so uh, there's no electrical conductivity, no spin order, no other type of uh, symmetry breaking, no, uh, uh, if, if it's a gap spin, spin liquid, there's no uh, a low energy specific heat or thermal conductivity. Okay, so, so um, um, uh, this is often what happens, you see nothing and then you get excited. Okay, so, so uh, clearly this is not a very satisfactory uh, uh, state of affairs. Okay, we'd like to have a more positive uh, signature of these states. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, as we know, these states actually are not boring. It's not that they do nothing. Uh, they're actually quite interesting. And the question is, the challenge, I think, in this field is how to actually expose this uh, non-trivial physics that's actually going on. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, we know that what, what do spin liquids have? Well, they're actually quite deep and interesting states of matter. They're they exhibit fractalization. They are described in terms of uh, emergent gauge field. Uh, uh, there are topological states of matter, why that, that's they, they sort of fit in, in this workshop. Uh, and uh, 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 in, the m in modern language, we characterize them as having long-range long quantum entanglement. Uh, okay, or, or uh, they, they are topologically ordered states, in other words. Okay, so uh, um, a, a way to characterize the, the, the maybe the simplest quantum spin liquid, the Z2 uh, uh, quantum spin liquid, is a gapped state of matter that has uh, a fractionalized excitations. So there, there are uh, actually different uh, topological sectors of the possible excitations of the system. So uh, uh, you can have uh, basically the vacuum or any trivial uh, or, uh, 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 excitation, local excitation, like a magnon, spin one excitation. You can have a spin on, which is spin half and charge zero, or a whole on, which is charge one and spin zero excitation. So, so this is a fractionalized excitation. It has quantum numbers that don't fit those uh, of the microscopic particle, which is the electron. And uh, this, uh, uh, both types of excitations actually are uh, charged under the emergent Z2 gauge symmetry. Okay, so they're called E particles because they're, they're electrically charged uh, under the, uh, under the uh, uh, emergent gauge field. There are the fluxes or the uh, uh, magnetic fluxes of, of, the of the same gauge field, which are, which are called visons. Okay, that's just the, that's the term and they're the bound states of the two. So uh, overall in this state of matter, there are four different topologically distinct sectors uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, excitations you can have. Okay, so the, the spin-ons and holons, by the way, can either be fermions or bosons. So, so that depends on the assignment. You, if you have a bosonic spin-on, for instance, you can bind it to a vison and you get a fermionic 
excitation to mean to demand, and same for the whole lands. Uh, so four four different uh, uh, sectors, and what what are they characterized by? How how to uh, characterize them? And they're characterized by their statistics. Okay, they all carry fr some fractional statistics. For instance, if you take a spin on er, uh, uh, in a closed loop around the Vison, you get a phase of minus one, and as was uh, discussed by Bela, these uh, this uh, uh, statistics actually characterizes the state. Okay, so. Uh a, a, a what's the status of search uh, in actual uh, microscopic models or in materials for these states of matter? Well, uh, there's a lot of activity in the last year and actually a lot of interesting progress on uh, a, a identifying these states in microscopic models of uh, a frustrated magnets. Okay, so, so the hypothesis is that uh, they should arise for low enough spin, frustrated enough a, a a lattices. So, uh, a for instance, on the Kagome lattice, there's been a, a lot of work, uh, actually, also by some people here. Um, okay, and uh, I, it does seem like uh, there is a range of parameters where the ground state of the system is a quantum spin liquid. It doesn't order. Uh, however, the type of uh, a, a of uh, a spin liquid which is actually realized in this is not clear yet. Okay, so it's probably either a gap Z2 spin liquid or a gapless a, a spin liquid with uh, Dirac fermions. And uh, there are also some some nearby phases uh, which break time reversal symmetry. These are chiral spin liquids, and that's been worked out by some people here. Okay, so so uh, it seems like these phases are there, at least in some range of parameters. It's not clear exactly which which of the different states there are, and 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 uh, how range how wide the the, the the range in parameter space yet. It uh, turns out to be hard to study, but uh, people have yet. Nevertheless, people have made a lot of progress. Okay, so in actual materials, there are some candidates, and there are actually more and more. Okay, I've listed only some of them here. So uh, there are materials that actually realize pretty much this model of spin halves on a Kagome lattice. Okay, that's called the, the Hubbard Spithite material. And indeed, if you cool that material down, you find no signatures of, of uh, spin order or, or any other type of order, like bond order, down to the lowest temperatures. A, a, and uh, a, there are also some organic materials that form triangular lattices. Which are not too far from a, me a metal insulator transition, and these these uh, materials on the insulating side also seem to be spin liquids. They uh, they don't order. A, a in both types of materials, there is um, there there is uh, a, a at low temperature the uh, a magnetic susceptibility is constant. The specific heat it goes like T. So th it looks like these are uh, if anything these are would would be gapless uh, uh, spin liquids. Um, uh, yeah. No, th there's a, the the um, spin liquid phase is actually there even for J two equals zero. That's actually just used to explore the phase diagram. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So so uh, uh, recently there's debate whether uh, there's a small gap or not in some of these materials, but uh, they look gapless at least over a large range of uh, of uh, temperature. Okay. So I'll I'll discuss in this talk both both gapped and gapless spin liquids and talk about pos possible signatures of them. Okay, so uh, uh, the challenge is can we actually probe topological order and fractionalization directly in some in some experiments? Okay, and what, what should we look for? And, uh, uh, the challenge for us as theorists is to try to find as accessible probes as possible. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about two different types of uh, 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 signatures in this in this talk. One is uh, what's what's going on at the edge of the quantum spin liquid, the gapped sp uh, quantum spin liquid, okay, and different types of edges which are possible and how to probe them. A and uh, a a a the other topic would be uh, transport in the layered quantum spin liquid. All, a, all of the materials that I'm I, I mentioned are actually uh, quasi-two-dimensional materials, so you can think about them as weakly coupled planes. And uh, a, a by comparing the transport, thermal transport in the plane and out of the plane, you can actually learn, learn something about the nature of the state. Okay, so uh, a, it turns out that uh, interesting things happen at the boundary of a Z2 quantum spin liquid. So this is a topologically ordered phase. A, its boundary is typically gapped, but it turns out that it, it can be gapped in, a, in several different or two different types a, of uh, distinct ways. Okay, so, so uh, even though the boundary is gapped, so you would think there's no life there, there is actually life at the boundary. It turns out that the boundary itself has to be gapped in a non-trivial way. And uh, the way to think about it is the following. Uh, so uh, th there are two types of gapped boundaries which are topologically distinct. And their distinction is uh, whether you can actually absorb a fractionalized excitation 
uh, at no at no energy cost at the boundary. So uh, uh, there are two types of boundaries. It turns out there's an E-type boundary and M-type boundary. The E-type boundary is characterized by being able to absorb the E particles, the charges of the Z2 gauge field, with no energy cost. So technically, what what you say is that the E particle is condensed at at at, uh, at this type of boundary. Uh, uh, whereas the M particle or the vison is condensed in the other type of boundary. Okay, and turns out to that uh, necessarily to have a gap boundary, the boundary has to fall into either of these two types. Okay, so so uh, uh, you can say if if the bulk uh, is in a Z2 quantum spin liquid phase, the boundary can either be gapless or be in one of these two gap phases. But there's no other option. Okay, so this is uh, now uh, uh, if you change some parameters of the Hamiltonian, say at the boundary only keeping the bulk intact, there has to be a phase transition at the boundary between these two phases. You, you, you cannot cross adiabatically between them, okay, as long as the bulk doesn't, uh, I, I doesn't fill the gap. Okay, so uh, uh, this uh, distinction between topologically uh, um, uh, this, uh, um, uh, uh, topological phases at the boundary of topologically ordered phases is, uh, is kind of a well-developed topic. Okay, so there are more and more uh, examples that people realized. Mike Levin actually classified the possible a, a gap boundaries that you can have at, at the edge of a, um, a, a any topologically ordered abelian phase. Okay, so there's a general uh, a understanding what types of uh, gap boundaries you can have, if you can have them at all. Some some phases cannot support a gap a boundary at all, but this this phase, for instance, can, and it, it, it can actually support two distinct types of gap boundaries. Okay, so now you can ask, well, if there are two types of gap, bu uh, gap boundaries, what happens if I try to uh, create a domain wall between them? So if I uh, gap the boundary in one way in, in, uh, in say, uh, this part of the edge and in a different way in, in uh, another part of the edge, so your I I I intuition would be, well, these are topologically distinct, so you cannot, cannot go smoothly. So there, there is some sort of zero mode at the boundary between them. That turns out to be correct. Okay, so necessarily there's a, z there's a zero mode at the... A interface at the boundary between two two d two different gap regions. In this case, this zero mode is actually a Majorana mode. Now, I, 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 we used to think about a, a Majorana mode as a zero mode for electrons. This is not quite that. Okay, there's no a zero mode here for physical a, a, a electrons. There's a zero mode here for the composite fermions that live in the bulk. Okay, so for for this bound state of a bosonic spin on and a vison, that can actually be absorbed at this point. It's a fermionic excitation, a fractionalized excitation of the bulk that can be absorbed at this point at zero energy cost. Okay, so there's some sort of topological zero mode that's living at the interface to create such a domain wall between two different gap phases of the boundary. Okay, so that's that's the physics of the of the boundary of uh, a topologically ordered phase in general. Now, uh, for the example of uh, Z2 quantum spin liquid, there are actually some constraints on what kind of gap boundary can you get, okay? So suppose you solve the Heisenberg model on the Kagome lattice and you have open boundary conditions and you found that the a, a boundary is gapped, which of the two a, a types of, uh, of uh, a, a gap phases on the, on the boundaries do you, do you have there, okay? So it turns out that you can know, okay? You can uh, know just by symmetry. The reason is simple. So uh, to have an E edge, you actually have to condense the E particle and the E particle in this case carries some a, a some uh, quantum numbers, so it's either a spin on or a hole on. So it either carries spin half and charge zero, or a charge a, a charge E, and uh, a spin zero. So for the uh, E particle to be condensed, you actually have to break some symmetries of the system. As long as your s as your system conserves charge and spin, if it's a gap boundary, there actually only there's actually only one option, which is the M edge. Okay, so. An M edge is the is the phase where the uh, a flux or the vison is condensed. And that doesn't carry any quantum numbers. Okay, at least not in general. It might carry some momentum. And that's that's a diff different uh, issue. Okay, but if the edge is not translationally invariant, then there's no worry. So uh, uh, that means that uh, uh, there you can actually have some handle on what kind of gap edge is realized at the boundary. Okay, so if you do nothing, naturally what you'll get if the edge is gapped, it's uh, it's an M edge. And if you want to realize the E edge, you actually have to break some symmetries. You either have to break spin rotational symmetry and time reversal symmetry. It turns out that you have to break them completely. It, it's not enough to break them down to U1. Okay, or you can uh, break uh, a charge conservation symmetry. 
Okay, and uh, uh, this is uh, what we discussed in this paper, and we actually recently we actually uh, demonstrated how all of this works in a exactly solvable Kitab type model. Okay, that has some uh, a conserved uh, U1 charge. Okay, so uh, here's um, an example of how you can realize an E-edge in a spin liquid. So um, imagine that you have a spin liquid which is not too far from a metal in a insulator transition, so the charge gap is not too large. So, uh, and now you pr just proximity couple it to a superconductor. Okay, you could just uh, have an uh, interface with a superconductor. So here are two possible terms you can have at the at the boundary between these two systems. Okay, you can have pair tunneling between the superconductor and the and the Z2 spin liquid, and you have s a, a some spin-spin coupling. Okay, so the prediction is that as a function of this delta edge, okay, which is the pair hopping between the superconductor and the uh, a Z2 quantum spin liquid. Okay, so once you have this uh, this term, U1 charge is already broken in the superconductor, so there's no U1 charge anymore. But uh, still, you can only tunnel charges in pairs. Okay, this is the charge of the Cooper pair. As a function of the strength of this coupling, you'll have a topological transition, which turns out to be Ising type. It's a transverse field Ising model type transition. Okay, and uh, uh, that takes you from the M uh, type edge to the E type edge in this in this region. Okay, so uh, Remember uh, uh, again, so uh, you uh, this is not the symmetry breaking transition because the U1 charge symmetry in the Z2 spin liquid is already broken by its proximity coupling to, to the superconductor. It's a topological transition, but nevertheless, there's some critical strength, which is basically overcoming the gap at the edge uh, where you uh, would go into the other type of edge. Okay, so, so uh, right, so that's the m basic prediction. Now, uh, what does this mean physically? Okay, so there's a physical process that would tell you that this part of the edge is actually an E edge. Let me describe that. That's uh, a, 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 that's uh, something we call the a statistics transmutation. Okay, so so it's a it's an interesting process, I think. Okay, so what you can do now is the following. So suppose you have a, an electron from the superconductor. Okay, so if this was an a, a, an M edge, the um, a electron basically cannot enter uh, the Z2 spin liquid okay, at um, sufficiently low, uh, uh, low, uh, low energy. If it entered, if you provide enough energy, it would actually have to fractionalize into the basic excitations of the Z2 spin liquid, which are a holon and a spinon. Okay, so the basic excitations are not an electron. They you actually have low ener uh, energy excitations, which are, which are um, a, a, a one that carries the spin of the electron and the other one that carries the a charge of the electron. A, let's let's suppose it's S wave, yeah. It doesn't yeah, it's uh, at, at the energy of the gap or slightly above the gap of the superconductor. Right. It's uh yeah, so so uh a yeah, so so here there there uh, the um uh, uh, the z two uh, spin liquid is also gapped. There's uh, different gaps here. There, there's a gap for electrons. There's a gap. There's a yeah. So I I I I, I basically want to do this uh, above the gap of the spinons, right? I'll describe what what I what I want to do. Okay. So so um if I if I do it in in uh, what I claim is that if I do it in if I give it enough energy. Um, just uh, I'll just finish the um, sentence. So if I do, if I uh, give the electron enough energy, it would enter, but it, it would actually fractionalize. So, so it would uh, enter a a a and um, a dissociate into two different particles. Okay. Yes. Right. So so here it actually doesn't matter. I I have to. Yeah, right. So, so, so I mean, uh, that's that's fine. So, uh, if I provide enough energy, it would enter, right? But then it would fractionalize. So, so it would uh, dissociate. It's it's um it it has, um, a, a basically what I'm assuming is that uh, a the spin on and the holon have lower energy than an electron in the spin liquid. So, if you put in an electron, it would dissociate. Okay, but this this would happen if you have an M edge. Okay, now uh, the interesting thing happens if you have an E edge here. So then things are a little bit different. So at an E edge, what happens at, th at this type of E edge, which is coupled to a superconductor, the the uh, charge holons are condensed. Okay, so that means that you can actually deposit a charge E spin zero holon at zero energy cost. So if you 
provide energy which is uh, high enough, uh, such that you exceed this the uh, uh, the gap for a spin-on in the Z2 quantum spin liquid, you, you can actually have a coherent process where you deposit the charge uh, of the electron at the boundary uh, that just goes to the condensate. And uh, uh, what remains is this is a fermionic spin-on, which would uh, uh, continue to uh, propagate coherently in the in the quantum spin liquid. Okay, so you've uh, coherently converted an electron into a fermionic spin-on. So basically, the uh, one w one other way to say it is that the uh, um the electron carries three quantum numbers. It carries charge, it carries spins, and it carries the uh, fermionic statistics. And somebody has to carry all of these things. So here, what happens is you leave a bosonic holon, so you leave the charge, uh, but you still have to carry the uh, spin and the statistics of the electron. So you have to uh, remain with a fermionic spin on in the bulk. Okay, let me just mention that this here I've actually assumed something. I've assumed that the lowest energy spin on excitation is a fermionic excitation. Okay, so this can actually propagate coherently. It cannot dissociate it to any, any other particle. Okay, so, so, so this, this all has a nice uh, description in terms of the particle construction. If you write the electron operator in this way, okay, as a, a bosonic a, a, a holon times a fermionic spin-on, then a what happens is that uh, at the E-type edge, the um, a bosonic holon is condensed. Okay, so this a a at the boundary, this essentially becomes a number. Okay, so you can uh, convert coherently uh, C into F, the electron into the uh, fermionic spin-on. Right, so so uh, the boundary is actually uh, right. So so um, at the boundary, the charge is condensed. So so really, what what that means, the charge actually doesn't remain on the boundary. It actually is part of the condensate of the superconductor. It's not. It's not. The, the charge is not localized at the boundary. Yeah. So so um, I mean, uh, you you shot an electron. The charge of the electron gets spread over the superconductor, and this this the spin continues. Okay, so uh, uh, right, so uh, um, a, a how to probe this? So so here's kind of our uh, our, our green setup. Okay, so uh, you can imagine uh, this type of setup. We have a superconductor and we apply some voltage. We uh, uh, this voltage uh, exceeds the the gap of the superconductor, so we shoot in um, uh, electrons. And now what we'll see if we measure a current. Okay, so we uh, we have some uh, a, a, a tunnel probe here. So uh, we just measure current going going this way, okay. And what what we'll see is that um, if we vary the voltage or if we vary the the length of the system, we'll see uh, coherent oscillations because there's a coherent process where the uh, uh, electron from here can convert into a fermionic spin-on, get reflected from the boundary, and uh, uh, there's basically some standing wave pattern here. And as you vary th uh, the voltage, you'll you'll, you'll see uh, 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 oscillations of this current that depend actually both on the length of the superconductor but also on the length of this uh, quantum spin liquid. So this, this, is, this tells you that actually this uh, coherent process occurs. If it wasn't coherent, you wouldn't see any, any oscillations here. Okay, if, if the uh, a electron actually dissociated into, uh, into a, a, a spin-on and a hole-on, when it, uh, when it enters this uh, quantum spin liquid, you, you wouldn't this process wouldn't be coherent. Okay, so, uh, right. so that's basically our prediction. Another type of uh, prediction of this process, okay, the same thing can, can actually happen as a function of a magnetic field. If you have uh, a, a, a enough an, a spin anisotropy of the system, so you can actually induce a transition between the M edge and the E edge a, in a also in a magnetic way. So basically you can condense a, a, a bosonic spin-ons at the edge. That's that's another a, a type of uh, topological transition between the two phases, between the same two phases, the M phase and the e, the, the uh, e phase. But you can induce that using uh, a, a so by a breaking spin rotational symmetry instead of charge a, a conservation symmetry. So s a this is our layered Z two spin liquid. Okay, it's planes going this way, and suppose you can apply an uh, inhomogeneous magnetic field such that it's uh, it's applied mostly at the edge. So here. Our way to do it is by uh, by having superconductors that repel the field. So uh, this is basically the boundary of the system, and the, f the field decays into the system. Okay, so we apply the field only at the edge, and uh, we have to assume here that the s a quantum spin liquid I I it doesn't have full SU2 invariance. Otherwise, uh, just applying a field in one direction is not enough. You have to break SU2 symmetry completely, not down to U1, and then uh, the 
prediction is that as a function of field, we'll have this topological transition between the M edge and the E edge. Okay, it's some critical field. And now if we, uh, uh, the signature of that would be in, in the uh, uh, thermal connectivity of the edge. Okay, so at some point, uh, uh, when we reach this uh, transition, the thermal connectivity uh, uh, sort of carried by the edge would, it would take this uh, uh, universal value. It's basically characteristic of an, of an Ising critical point. Okay, so uh, it's basically a NL here is just a number of layers, and this is a, a universal number, which, which is characteristic of the central charge of this critical point, C equals half. Okay, so that's, that's what I plan to say about boundaries of quantum spin liquids, a and in the uh, remaining time, let me talk about uh, a, 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 a thermal connectivity in, in, a, in a layered system. Okay, so this is yet another way to, to probe the fractionalizations in a, in, a, in a quantum spin liquid, but this time it would be in a gapless quantum spin liquid. Okay, so how, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, okay, so, uh, right. Okay. Uh, uh, right, so, so um, thermal transport has been proposed as a probe to uh, uh, for uh, quantum spin liquids. So, um, as I mentioned before, many of the materials are actually seem, seem to be gapless quantum spin liquids. So there are, we know that there are low energy uh, uh, excitations. For instance, the specific heat goes like uh, uh, C over T uh, uh, goes to a constant at, at, low, at low temperature. Okay, but now that leaves you with a question, what are these low energy, energy excitations? For instance, are they localized or delocalized? Okay, so there was the, there's always the worry that if, uh, uh, if you have um, constant specific heat, but no type of order, what you're looking at is just, for, in this, uh, for instance, a, um, a, an Anderson insulator. Okay, so this, this is a phase of matter that we know has a, a, a constant specific heat at low temperature, but it's not, it's not fractionalized in any way. Okay, so uh, thermal transport is useful because it can answer that question. Okay, the idea is that a gapless spin liquid should have no a electrical transport. It's an insulator, but it still has thermal transport because the, uh, the spin-ons in this case actually carry a heat and they're delocalized. Okay, so uh, this experiment has been done on some of the organic spin liquid candidates, and uh, some of them have uh, a, a ratio of kappa over T that goes to zero at low temperature. Okay, so it's plotted here in a funny way. It's kappa over T as a function of T squared. That's because phonons contribute, uh, are expected to contribute uh, T cubed a, a part. Okay, so uh, this basically um, a divides that off. And if this goes to a constant, that means that there's a linear in T part of kappa. So that's presumably um, a, um, the, part, the part that's uh, coming from the spin-on. So th that's, that's basically the same as what you would get in the metal. So it's basically um, what, what you're looking for here is uh, a, a, a thermal connectivity that looks like a metal in an insulating material. Okay, so that's, that's quite remarkable. And that's actually been seen in one of these, uh, one of these systems, not, but not in others. Okay, so um, uh, okay, so we're actually proposing a, an, a, a another a, a, a measurement, which is basically uh, thermal thermal connectivity in the system, but now in the c-axis, so basically perpendicular to the layers. This this has been thermal thermal connectivity in in the in the plane. Okay, so uh, immediately you see that there's going to be a qualitative difference between the thermal transport in the plane and between the planes. And that's for the following reason. The thermal connectivity in the plane is carried by spin-ons, in this case, the fractionalized excitations, which can propagate coherently. So that, that, that's why they're very effective in, in carrying the heat. But the thermal, thermal connectivity in the, in the transverse direction actually cannot be carried by the fractionalized excitations because it has to be, be because the operators that couple are local operators. So they, they cannot uh, transfer anything that has fractionalized quantum numbers. They have to transfer integer quantum numbers, okay? So in this example, if we spin liquid, a, 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 a only pairs of spin-ons that have an integer spin can actually tunnel between, between planes, okay? So the, the mechanism of the thermal transport is very different. So we actually expect some qualitative uh, differences. Okay, so now these are very anisotropic materials, so you might uh, think, well, what's, um, a, m what's surprising about seeing uh, a anisotropy in the transport? Okay, so here it's parametric uh, 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 difference between kappa C and kappa AB. Okay, th this, this has been proposed actually in the context of RVB theory early on, okay, for the group rates. Yes, yeah, right. So, so uh, yeah, what, 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 what I'll, I'll show is that uh, it, it goes with a, with a, a different exponent 
uh, well of temperature in, in the plane, in, uh, out of the plane. Okay, so um, uh, for example, if you just have an anisotropic metal where the uh, uh, electrical or thermal transport are both carried by uh, electrons and single electron can tunnel between planes, what you expect is that if the system is anisotropic, uh, kappa AB and kappa C would be different, but the ratio would actually go to a constant at, at, at low temperature. Okay, what happens is that at low enough temperature, there are a coherent electronic quasi-particles that form some corrugated Fermi surface. Yeah. A, a, okay, and um, a eventually they can propagate coherently, although with a different effective mass, either in the plane or between planes. Okay, and this is not going to be the case here. So uh, this is what we want to achieve, sort of a table that would tell us, uh, sort of this is a fig fingerprints, if you like, of different layered quantum spin liquids. So we can look at either in-plane or out-of-plane thermal conductivity, uh, either in the presence of disorder or uh, uh, without disorder. And these are different types of uh, gapless quantum spin liquids, either a Z2 quantum spin liquid with a Dirac spe spectrum or with a, with a Fermi surface or uh, a uh, U1 quantum spin liquid. Okay, and uh, each one of these phases has its own characteristic power law of temperature, of uh, a thermal conductivity as a function of temperature. Okay, and uh, uh, the important thing is that these are different in the plane and, and uh, uh, out of the plane, and sometimes they're also different between different quantum spin liquids. Okay, so um, uh, uh, most notably, if you look at the ratio uh, uh, kappa C over kappa AB, that actually goes to zero at low temperature. So uh, having this parametrically large anisotropy is the hallmark of having a layered quantum spin liquid. Okay, so in the, the uh, remaining minutes, let me just uh, say uh, a few words about the calculation. Okay, so um, um, in the Z2 quantum spin liquid case, we have an exactly solvable model for uh, the phase in the plane, which is Kitaev's honeycomb model, useful just as a, um, as a prototype. Okay, and we consider a, l a layered version of this model, and uh, we write basically uh, all the allowed a a a couplings between the planes, and when you uh, a reduce it to the effective low energy model, okay, so this model has a phase which ha which has which is characterized by having a Dirac spectrum of uh, a, 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 a fermionic a fractionalized excitations. Okay, what you see is that uh, the uh, the uh, in-plane Hamiltonian looks like a quadratic Hamiltonian, but the out-of-plane is actually quadratic. So this is precisely the um, this effect that you can uh, only couple the planes by tunneling pairs of uh, a, a, a fermionic excitations and not single fermi uh, fermions. Okay, so uh, now it's a kind of as you turn the crank, so you can compute the thermal current operator in the c-axis by uh, a, a basically commuting the um, a, a Hamiltonian density with the with the uh, a interplane coupling. Okay, and you calculate the the, um, a, a, a the uh, a thermal conductivity using the Kubo formula. Basically, you're doing a current current correlation function. It ends up looking like this okay, because the thermal current here is a quartic operator. So you have to convolve two uh, two particle propagators in each in each plane. Okay, so uh, here are some, some results. For the case of a Dirac spectrum, what you get is that kappa AB scales like, like temperature, whereas kappa C scales like the temperature to the fifth power. Okay, so this, uh, this high power comes from the fact that the uh, density of states here vanishes at low energy. If you, uh, uh, so uh, uh, that means basically that the C-axis transport is gonna be completely overwhelmed by the, by the phonon contribution. Okay, the phonon contribution goes like two cubed, so that's gonna dominate the C-axis transport, but not the in-plane one. In practice, what we expect to see here is t and t, t cubed rather than t to the fifth. A, a on, on the other hand, in the case of a Fermi surface, so it turns out that in the Kitaev model, for instance, you can actually uh, have a, a, a finite Fermi surface of spin-ons if you break time reversal symmetry in the right way. Okay, so that basically shifts, if you like, the chemical potential away from zero. Um, uh, so you have a finite density of states at low, low energy. In this case, if you don't have disorder, kappa AB is actually infinite just like in a clean metal, okay? But kappa C turns out to uh, scale like t squared. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, in the Kitaev model, let me just uh, comment that this uh, having a Fermi surface in a Z2 quantum spin liquid requires time reversal symmetry. That's not general. You can actually stabilize this in, uh, on other lattices without breaking time reversal. Uh, okay, so, so uh, uh, we wanna see what happens in a more realistic case. For instance, the experiments kappa AB is finite. That's presumably because of disorder. So uh, what happens if you, have if you uh, add disorder? So uh, um, uh, we basically assume that there's a disorder in every layer and that it's uh, stati uh, statistically independent. Uh, we also assume that the uh, uh, disorder is weak, such that KFL within the layer of the spin-ons is much bigger than one. 
Uh, and then we just uh, repeat the calculation in the standard way, sort of self-consistent Gordon approximation. These are uh, disorder lines, and this is uh, these are dressed uh, in, in, in spin on Green's functions in each layer. Okay, red and blue here are the two layers. So it's a convolution of two particle propagators. Each one gives you a diffusive behavior because it's just like electrons with disorder. Okay, so uh, a, a this is the result. So the in-plane thermal conductivity goes like T, just like in the metal, and the out-of-plane one is, is still T squared, but with a different coefficient. So, so the coefficient now actually de depends on the uh, diffusion constant uh, within each layer. Okay, and uh, finally, we also, uh, uh, okay, so, so uh, uh, in this case, both kappa AB and kappa C are finite, but one of them goes like T and the other one goes like T squared. So that's the ratio actually diverges, kappa AB over kappa C diverges uh, uh, when you go to low temperature. Nevertheless, the interesting thing here is that kappa C that you get from the spin-on contribution, which is much, l much less than ka kappa AB, is still much bigger than the phonons parametrically. Okay, the phonons go like T cubed. So this is really a very striking observation, uh, uh, this T squared. This is what we propose to look for. Okay, uh, the last case we, we uh, talked about is maybe the least und well understood case, the U1 spin liquid. So here there's no solvable model, unfortunately. Okay, there's no uh, solvable model that gives a spin-on Fermi surface coupled to a U1 gauge field. Um, a, a, a nevertheless, we, uh, we solve the model using RTA. So here it's an in, um, a approximation which is not controlled. A, a, okay, it's believed to be uh, a, a to work in, uh, under, some, under some assumptions. And uh, we consider a, a layer version of this bundle. So, so uh, once again, there's a, a interplane a term which is quartic in the spin-on operators. But here, there's another type of interplane a, a coupling which is possible. So a here, a the, the low energy degrees of freedom are not only the spin-ons, they're also the U1 a gauge fluctuations. Okay, so this uh, type of, of, uh, of uh, a spin liquid is characterized by having both, both uh, spin-on Fermi surface and also a U1 gauge fluctuation, or a photon, an emergent photon. And uh, a this, this uh, gauge field can also couple between the planes. So this is basically the lowest order a symmetry allowed coupling. It's like, a, it's like curl A times curl A, so you see it's gauge invariant. And uh, a what it actually describes is a coupling between the spin chiralities of the, uh, of the local spin textures in the two layers. Okay, so it's a higher order coupling. It might, uh, yeah. Yeah. So so uh, right. So so uh, what what we can write is uh, any term which is uh, uh, independently gauge invariant in the two layers. So uh, this this gauge symmetry is emergent. Okay. So it's uh, it's not it's not the physical U1 symmetry. So uh, a, a the only operator that can couple between planes, which is which means the only local local operator is something which is gauge invariant separately in the two planes. That's why you can't you can't write side aggregate sign. A, a, yeah, there is a term like that. I, I didn't find it. Yeah, so cr uh, curl A squared in one layer, that's also allowed. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's included, right. Uh, yeah, it, it turns out to be relevant relative to the coupling of the gauge field to the fermions, but uh, yeah, but, but, but you, you, uh, you actually have to include it, yeah. Okay, so uh, right. Uh, yeah, so let me just uh, quote the result. Within the RTA approximation, okay, which is not controlled in this case, what you get is that in the in the clean case, kappa C actually goes like uh, this funny power, okay, t to the power of five thirds. The place this power comes from is uh, actually it's uh, it's um, a, a two minus one over z, where z is the dynamical critical exponent of this phase, which is three. Okay, so uh, it's, it's uh, a kind of interesting that it tells you something about the dynamical criti uh, critical exponent. Um, uh, okay, but uh, uh, if you add this order, you're actually back to uh, to t squared because of the diffusive uh, dynamics of the spin-ons in the plane. Okay, so that's it. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs>